G'day, I'm Tim Thompson. Today I'm talking about a subject that I'm really excited to finally be presenting. It's something I wanted to talk about for a while, rural crime. It's something that affects a lot of us and it's not always as simple as you think. I've got the pleasure today of spending some time with Dr. Alistair Harkness, who's a senior lecturer in criminology at the University of New England. And he's also worked at Monash University and Federation University. And his specialty is rural crime. And he actually leads an international project looking at patterns in rural crime and how to prevent it. Alistair, welcome G'day, to the channel, Tim, mate. how are you? Good to see you. This is a topic that I've been busting to do for quite some time. Oh, um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward to meeting a few people. Well, I've, I've lined up a few different places for us to go and visit. Um, I've lined up a, a hobby farm that breeds miniature goats, of all things. And then we've got a major strawberry grower in the, in the flats of the valley. And then finally, we've got uh, Alan, who's a good friend of mine, who has beef cattle um, down in Yarra Glen. So, all of them have different experience with, with rural crime and all of them um, are potentially going to be affected by rural crime differently. Yeah, and there's nothing homogenous about uh, rural spaces or about rural offending. Different horses for courses, as they say, and, uh, and different strategies necessary to prevent a crime from happening in different settings. <laughs> So first stop for Alistair and myself was to go and visit Andrew, who with his wife Linnell, run a successful little hobby farm in the Yarra Valley. Their two major enterprises are breeding miniature goats and selling firewood. And this creates some unique risks as far as farm crime prevention. So we were keen to have a chat about this. So she'd be worth a thousand dollars. Right. Um, he, if we kept him whole, several thousand. Not, none of them are too big, they're all been dehorned. Um, so they're easy to look after. Andrew, how are you mate? Hey Tim, good, good to, to see you, you again. again. I see you've already met Alice there and <laughs> been talking yep. goats. Yeah, we have been talking goats. We do love yeah, our classic. goats. Yeah. Um, so you're really keen to get Alice's perspective on preventing rural crime. Absolutely. For a lifestyle property. Yep. Um, and I think it's an important discussion that we have today. Um, I see that you've already been talking about the value of your livestock, not only in terms of monetary sense, but in terms of emotional investment. Yeah. Um, yeah. Particularly for a hobby farmer, that, that's something that you've got to factor in, isn't it, Alistair? Is that crime is more than just monetary value? Oh, that's right. Uh, and uh, notwithstanding the fact that you've got the assurance, the loss of them would be much more than the monetary value. Every day. And a lot of people in urban settings have no comprehension. You know, a breeding yeah. ram, for instance, could yeah. be worth fifty thousand dollars, fifteen, twenty years worth of work building up the bloodline, and. Uh, Somebody just says it's an animal on four legs. Um, doesn't mean anything to anybody else, but to that farmer, it means everything. Exactly um, right. Yeah. And for us as a hobby farmer, you know, we're not in the we're not in this for the money. This is not a business for us. This is a lifestyle. We're invested in these animals, you know, in their well-being, um, and also the happiness that they bring to us, our family, and our friends. What are some of the main tips that you would give um, hobby farmers, for example? Um, to help protect their emotional and financial investment while Andrew gets mugged by the goat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess one of the things about the hobby farm, it's probably not going to ha you don't have employees coming up from the property, so some of that opportunistic yep. theft is not going to be as big a, an issue. Uh, you're away from some of the main roads, so people aren't driving past, but it's about that vigilance. Mm. And, uh, and um, you don't have a lot of neighbours around, uh, so you've not got the human eyesight, but uh, a lot of people will be investing in camera technology, mm. some fairly sophisticated and much cheaper now than it has yes. been in the past, uh, activated, motion activated cameras. You can get to send a message to your phone and, and live stream phones, and everything. Yeah, um, yeah. Mm. So for a hobby farmer who's away from the property, as many hobby farmers are, I mean Andrew tends to work from home, but a lot of hobby farmers can only be there on weekends and at night time. Camera technology is a good investment. Camera technology is a great investment. Knowing your neighbours uh, is really important. Just uh, and encouraging reporting. Uh, yes. You see a suspicious vehicle. You might not, if you're only here, uh, other hobby farmers only coming onto the property once a week or once a fortnight, you're not going to have that vigilance, uh, yes. but having other people in their local area that can. So I know a lot of farmers will set up WhatsApp groups so yep. they can just constantly be in touch. That yes. sort of traditional rural grapevine is really important stuff too. Not everything has to has to cost a lot of money. Yep. There's to be simple things, you know, padlocks on gates, uh, practical things. Um, digging ditches along you know, roadways so that utes and four-wheel drives will find it difficult to get in onto the property, securing the fence lines, making sure yep. the fences are, 
are um, secured. I mean, so you don't lose the sock as well, but just whatever you can do to make it more difficult for the offender to offend. Mm. One of the things about some of the camera technologies that has a dependency on the internet, which not everyone gets. Yes. So how do we get around that? Well, that's the, that's the real challenge. <laughs> you know, uh, it's about making sure that the broadband technology is, is stretched far and wide. There'll be pockets where, where it's not. Mm -hmm. oh, it leads on to some of the other types of offending. We always automatically think of farms as theft of livestock, theft of machinery, but then there's the interpersonal criminal behaviour that happens, so the violence offences as well. So I know somebody who's being a victim of violent offending on their properties, a long way from their neighbours, uh, won't have close family and friends, and if you don't have reliable uh, telephony or broadband, you're not going to be able to send out messages to seek help and guidance advice as well. Mm -hmm. So there are some real challenges in some of the more remote parts of the country. And that's a good point, Alistair. It's not just theft that's a problem for a hobby farmer, but there's a whole raft of issues that relate to social conditions um, and local community health um, that can impact on people that move to the idealised country yes. and they find out that all of a sudden things aren't so ideal anymore and that there are social problems nearby. Yeah. Well there's a couple of, couple of points there. There's this notion which has persisted for hundreds of years that rural places are crime free, they're idyllic. We had the, you know, the industrial revolution and we said there's mass migration to the big new cities in the 1700s, the 1800s and so the rural spaces became this escape from the you know, this TV mm. shows, escape mm. from the country, you know, this is a notion. But you know, there is a lot of crime that occurs, and some of those antisocial behaviours, hoon behaviour, mm -hmm. illegal hunting and trespass across properties as well. Mm -hmm. So an offender will see a, uh, you know, take a straight line from A to B, but if that happens to be through uh, somebody's fences, breaking their gates, you know, getting on the turps and driving through and shooting up beehives and sheds and so on and so forth, and that is very impactful on farmers too. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I, you know, you're quite right, Tim. It's not just the um, the theft from farms which. Um, can cause enormous uh, economic and also social harm. And that reporting of that incidental crime is important. I mean, you know, we were, we were speaking off camera. I've, I've had the, the horrible experience myself of attending, being first on the scene at a fatal crash. And we have hooning behaviour out the front of our place all the time with people doing donuts. And it's quite remarkable. You ring the police and no one else has reported it. Yes, yeah. Um, and yet that is going to kill someone. Yeah. So it's important to actually communicate with the police, yep. isn't it? It is. Uh, and you're, you're also liable to, Andrew, if someone hurts themselves on your property. Yep. Um, and you've had experience with people arriving uninvited on your property. I have, yes. I've had uh, late night visitors at 10pm, unannounced, yeah. Yeah. yes. Uh, it's Absolutely. not a nice feeling, is it? No, but to your point, Alistair, about the personal security, you know, we have a very close relationship with all our WhatsApp, with all our neighbours, with the WhatsApp channel. And in that instance, we had uh, two of our neighbours arrive when I went down to confront that incident. Um, and it was, it was very reassuring yes, yes. from a personal security point of view, not just for me, but for my family as well. Yeah. The reporting is absolutely crucial, and not yes. enough farmers do actually report the crimes that happen. Now, there's a whole range of reasons that they nominate. Uh, she'll be right mentality is yeah. um, writ large, um, not knowing if there has been an offence. So yes. I know sheep farmers, you know, they'll um, muster their sheep four, five times a year at the most, you know, for drenching, counting, shearing. They notice um, 200 missing. 200 missing out of a flock of 2,000. Yeah. It could have even been just 20 and, uh, and not really know. You know, there's been rain, there's been dust storm, any evidence is well and truly gone. So, so what are the police going to actually do about it? Yeah. And then there's some of those other issues with dealing with the police. And this is where there needs to be much more effort in breaking down those boundaries which exist between police and, and rural rural people, yeah. uh, encouraging that reporting. So when the, when the police officer, the constable turns up, having some basic awareness of, of what country life is like and what they're talking about, because that automatically will put a, a real um, gap between uh, the farmer and the police if the person has no idea what they're doing. And to their credit, the police, at least in this country, seem to be doing something about that. Well, things have changed enormously in, in recent times. So in Victoria, we've got the Farm Crime Liaison Officers. Mm. They originally started in 2011 as uh, Agricultural Liaison Officers have changed. They've got a, um, a really solid community of practice. Uh, up in New South Wales, the New South Wales Rural Crime Prevention Team, a team of 60 or so uh, rural police investigators mm. and half the um, half of their time is spent educating educating people about crime prevention as well as doing the investigations you know the adage is you know prevention is better than cure next up it was michael petanella 
who, with his family, runs a very successful large strawberry growing operation. And for a strawberry grower, Michael's had some very unique and interesting impacts of rural crime. To find out more, we stopped by and had a visit with him. You've had some issues with your boundaries. Over the back of your property here, you've actually got a commercial chook farm, um, and that's caused some issues for you with animal liberationists, even though you don't farm any animals at all. Can you tell me a little bit about that story? Well, one of our eternal fences was broken. Yep. And I presume was, was over our, there somewhere. Yeah, and I presume one of our tractor drivers. And there yep. were cows in this paddock here. And um, it was some weeks later, I was down the back road here, and I saw the fence was cleanly cut. Yep. So I spoke to my neighbour who puts cows in our place, and I said, this back fence is broken. I said, have you done any work here? He was unaware, because there was actually calves in here. Yeah, and, right. Um, what, and then I, then I let me work, then I looked at my fence was broken. It was a coincidence, in a straight line, there was our fence to the road cut, two of our internal fences broken, and the chook farm mesh had been cut too. All in a straight line, straight to the straight, um, uh, Yeah, just uh, straight up, three fences in a straight line and one to the left. So, um, yeah. and we spoke to the chook farm and yeah, there was an incident there. And what was so disappointing, nothing to do with us, but there was, there was cows, calves in this paddock. Yes. And there was one wire on top, that the fence wire was left open, was right. on but all their bottom wires were cut. So the animal liberationists... Yeah, because yeah, uh, they, did, they did post it on... So according to the neighbour, it was posted on social media and, the, and I think they went to the police, I'm not too sure, but yeah. they were caught and he's now got cameras all around his place. Yep. But it, I, couldn't, I couldn't understand their mentality or why they cut through our place on three fences yep. and left it open and I had no idea and all yeah. these presumed was our staff being poor tractor drivers breaking fences when it wasn't. Oh. And not just that. And you've got some of the best tractor drivers there are. <laughs> and not just that, I had my neighbours cattle on, on our property. Yeah. We're friend, we've been long time friends. And something could have happened to yeah, them. Yeah, they could have wandered this out. This is a public road. And what would happen if, if someone hit, hit with the livestock? Am yeah. I responsible? Yeah. Yeah. Is he responsible? Who's responsible there? <laughs> so Alistair, from your research, what are some of the main things that Michael could do to secure his back boundary fence, considering the fact that he's not checking it all the time? It's really about um, uh, being vigilant and being observant. So getting around on a regular basis and checking the boundaries, making sure there are no holes in the fence. It's, sometimes it's easier said than done though because you've got a extensive fence lines, so you're not going to invest thousands and thousands of dollars in cameras right along along these properties. No. So really it's some of those uh, cost effective measures, you know, regular patrols, making sure that um, you know, eyes are open, ears are open. Locks on gates are, are really important, making it as hard as possible for the offenders to offend. It makes it hard on staff yes. who need access. Yes. To give all the staff members a key, it's a bit and hard. And then you've got 100 keys in circulation. Yeah, how, how big a key ring are you, going to, are you going to have? There are some of the issues whether there can be so padlocks that are, are keyed alike, uh, so it cuts down on the number of, number of keys. But really, Crime Prevention 101 is making it as difficult as possible for the offenders to offend. Uh, making it not worth their while. They'll always look for a softer target, so target hardening is important. Some of those situational crime prevention measures as well, fundamentally important in, um, in reducing uh, the impacts of rural crime. Next up, fuel theft. So, diesel theft, you've experienced a bit? Two occasions. And what happened on those occasions, Michael? Um, the lance was padlocked to it, so yep. the hose was cut. The car had a trailer, a thousand litre shuttle, filled it up, then drove off and left the hose dangling. So they didn't just steal a thousand litres, what they also did was they left the rest of your fuel on the ground. Which is not good. But you know, could pollute your waterways, could do all of that sort of damage as well on top of losing yeah. the fuel. So I noticed that this fuel tank is nowhere near a road and it's nowhere to be seen. Yeah, this, so we have changed things around that, that particular occasion was on another part of the far of the farm, and um, we now keep less fuel in that in that spot. We have less fuel stored, and now we are resetting up a spot here where we hope to. Um, why we're now off the road, yes. but we will eventually um, 
take some more precautions. Yes, Have and we're not going to say check. what those precautions are because well, we don't want people to know where your fuel's going to be. I might have to think about maybe um, a, a, an alarm on the fuel, on the fuel bowser maybe. If there's a one we can use Wi-Fi or something, I'd love to yeah. find out. Now, Alistair, fuel, co fuel theft and chemical theft is increasing? Uh, certainly it is, Tim, and uh, a good indication and a good uh, example of where uh, changes in supply and demand and yep. economic costs can have a huge impact on, on farmers. Fuel's gone through the roof, people have been filling up here in Australia at over $2 a litre, uh, $4 and something a gallon over in America, and, uh, and obviously the, the cost of diesel uh, fundamentally important for farmers as an yes. input, um, but obviously very attractive to people who want to save some money themselves. Same too for um, boxes of chemicals. I know uh, probably used here in the, uh, in the in the berry industry, certainly in the citrus industry, in the stone fruit industry. And uh, why spend two hundred dollars on a on a box of chemicals if you can knock one off from somebody else? You know, so always cutting those costs. Uh, but obviously, there's going to be a victim in mm. in all of those occasions. But a really good example about how changes in the economy will change the different types of offending which, are, which occurs in rural spaces. So for large operators like Michael, rural crime is an evolving thing that they have to continuously adapt to. Yeah, uh, offenders will look for whatever they can, uh, can get easily and whatever they can dispose of easily as well, uh, whether it's for themselves or, uh, or to, uh, to on-sell uh, to somebody else. And so the onus is really on uh, farmers to make sure they put in as many crime prevention measures as possible, onus on government and, uh, and police as well to make sure that farm crime is taken seriously and is acted upon. Now Michael you've got some fantastic new setup for your machinery as well, in the past you've had the typical farm shed that was open to one and all near the road, you've relocated your machinery shed, can you tell us a little bit about that? Come look Tim, we're, yeah, we, we're improving. Alright, this is a pretty impressive new shed here Mike, you're moving all your machinery away from roads and, and bringing it to the centre of the farm, that gives you some security advantages? Yeah, security and um, different manageability. Yeah. And, and your tractors don't have to travel as far, do they? Yeah, it's, it's amazing. So it's yeah. smart farming, isn't it, to have your tractors and your fuel in the middle of the farm rather than the edge? If you can afford to, yeah. And, yeah. and the sheds were op open sheds, long wooden posts, a bit of corrugated iron, yeah, it's like a hay shed, that's the way they work. Whereas these are fully lockable, roller doors, alarm systems, the works. Alistair, storage of equipment and vehicles, is that of a primary concern with preventing opportunistic theft? Oh, it is, and particularly for uh, things that are easily taken. So the really big tractors are going to be targeted. Yep. Uh, smaller things like quad bikes, um, chainsaws, all of those other tools and equipment, anything can be tucked in the back of a ute, they're going to go very easily. Uh, where there's a market, and there always is, somebody will always be looking for something a bit cheaper mm. through um, online advertising, uh, and they'll, ta they'll be targeted, or it'll be opportunistic thieves who see something lying around, nobody's watching, I think I can make a few dollars. Putting in as many barriers as possible is fundamentally important to, uh, to try to deter that offending from happening. And if everybody does it, yep. then it's really putting a pincer movement on those crooks. They'll have to find something, some other way of, of making They'll the money. They'll find a softer target yeah. somewhere else. A capable guardianship, as they say in the crime prevention literature, and whether yep. it's human beings or it's uh, cameras, yes. making sure that there is a, a, a proof of evidence uh, that can be handed over to police for investigations and inquiries. There have been some great examples. There was a, a bloke out in central Victoria a number of years ago and he was losing a lot of hay bales. And it turned out it was one of the employees who would just be loading up the back of the ute every time he was there, you know, dwindling supplies of, uh, of the bales. So he set up some cameras with the, with the police and they were able to apprehend him very quickly thereafter. But there was, uh, without that, that uh, video evidence, there was always that doubt about who the offender might have been. I'd hate to falsely accuse anyone, but I'd hate to do that. Mm. And, and where there's a little bit of a doubt, you, yeah, you don't want you to don't be... You don't want to... Nah, nah. And, and the offenders will take advantage of that, that good, good nature and good grace as well. So they'll keep on doing it, you know. What's the chances that somebody's going to tap me on the shoulder and ask me some questions? So it's about making sure that the, uh, they're deterred from doing the offending in the first place. Next up, we stopped in on Alan Upton to find out what he was worried about in terms of rural crime with his grazing property. Alan, how are you, mate? Good, thanks, Tim. Long time no see. Yes. Good to see you again. Yes. Alan, this is Alistair. Hey, Alan, Alistair. how are you? Good to see you. Now, Alistair, Alan has some concerns with his livestock. We're on about, what, 160 acres out here? Yeah, a bit more, yeah. A little about bit more. that sort of thing, yes. And you've got 
a fair few head of cattle yeah, in, the, in the paddock at the moment. close to 200 head of livestock there. And with uh, meat prices the way they are, you might be a little bit concerned. They be tempting for somebody. Yeah, is that your experience, Alistair? Oh, absolutely. When the uh, when the value of items go up, so too does the uh, the appetite for offenders to uh, to go and steal. We yeah. see that with livestock. We see it with uh, diesel. We see it with a whole range of different um, farm inputs. Uh, certainly, there has been a massive spike in the uh, the number of thefts of livestock in recent times with the the value of meat. What does your average livestock thief look like? <laughs> Thieves come in all shapes and sizes, of course, and uh, uh, one thing that is for sure is that they'll have a acquired industry knowledge. Yep. Uh, not everybody can go and steal um, uh, sheep or cattle or other, other types of livestock. There has to be some awareness. So if you grow up in the city, even in the suburbs, you're not going to know what to do. But if you have a good working dog, it's well trained. Uh, you've got the ability to do the, th the offending, but you've also got the supply lines in place so you can dispose of the, uh, the livestock. You're, you're well on your way to being a, a criminal mastermind with livestock. Now, Alan, you've got a concern here at this particular part of your property. Can you explain that? Yes, well, Tim, that's my paddock there, which potentially can have stock in there, stock car cows and calves. This roadway out here, this is a gravel road. It is a public gazetted road yep. and people have got access to this back corner of my property away from my house it's out of out of sight because of this line of uh, cypress trees here and the next door neighbour does have this set of stockyards here which in my main mind would make it very convenient paddock of cows there ramp here public road there I could do it in 10 minutes Yes. Why couldn't somebody else? Exactly. So it's right. a bit of a recipe yeah. for disaster, isn't it? So yeah. what, what are the, what are the what are the recommendations that you would have for this particular situation, Alison? So first and foremost, it's about making the offending as difficult as possible, yep. and the likelihood of getting caught as uh, as highly probable as possible. So in terms of uh, of deterring the offending in the first place, it would be about making sure that uh, the use of the ramp is inhibited. Yep. Uh, perhaps it's by putting in uh, certain. Uh, Mechanisms to uh, to make it very difficult for wire snips or uh, or other ways of uh, of getting access to that. In terms of uh, some of the other technological approaches, perhaps a, a carefully chosen camera position, which yeah. can then be monitored, it can be monitored uh, on the phone through uh, Wi-Fi, uh, motion activated, uh, so that uh, you can uh, detect if somebody's coming up through this road and you sort of a, a beeper goes off and you can then, uh, hmm, what's happening here? An immediate question, do the signs under camera surveillance, do they do anything? They do, um, e even in those cases where there might not camera? be a camera, because the thief is always going to say, what is the um, likelihood of me getting caught? Yeah. Uh, and if they think, hmm, I can't be sure whether these cameras are not, it's like some people used to put uh, guard dog patrols these premises. Yeah, there's a, there there's a some shih tzu in the back. Elderly <laughs> cat or a chihuahua, yeah, a little shih tzu. Yeah. Making them think that there is that chance, increasing the, uh, their hesitation about the offending, or will they just go off and find a softer target somewhere else? Yeah. So signage is important. That combined with property marking, so marking the animals in various different ways, uh, putting in place um, physical barriers, so perhaps digging a ditch so that the a ute or a truck or a horse float, uh, which are often used for particularly stealing the smaller animals like uh, sheep, making it much more difficult for them to actually get into the uh, into the places. So effectively putting a moat between your property boundary and the road. Yeah, effectively. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it also has the benefit of stopping uh, other people from trespassing as well. There yep. could be illegal shooters, uh, activists, other people who are wanting to come uh, uh, across the property for whatever reason and making it much more difficult. You wanted to control the access to the property as much as possible. Okay. I know cable is harder to cut than chain. Anybody mm -hmm. can cut a bit of chain pretty quickly. So maybe have a word with the neighbour and we'll together come up with a something to take this ramp out of such easy access as it is there now. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it's right at the end of this road, isn't it? It's just <laughs> perfect. perfect. It's perfect. You back it up. <laughs> what? times would you be most vigilant for stock there? Uh, it's any time um, and I guess it, it really depends on what the offending so if somebody's wanting to steal uh, full fleece sheep there's yep. going to be a particular time of the year that that happens before yep. shearing um, they might also be waiting to see once the shearing has occurred and then go and uh, take the bales out of the uh, 
out of the, the wool shed. Other times, um, some very experienced uh, uh, sheep uh, thieves uh, will be able to direct their dogs by moonlight, by hand signals rather than yep. whistling, so they can come in very covertly, not be seen. I recall a farmer in Seymour a number of years ago demonstrating to me the ease at which it was to peel 20 sheep off a mob of 200. It took less than 60 seconds. They could have been run up in a straight line into the back of a horse float or a tandem trailer or a small truck or a van uh, and they'll be away in no time. In fact, very reminiscent of this scenario here where there's no uh, properties within visual distance um, and so you don't have that capable guardianship which is so important, you know, whether electronic or, or human. People aren't going to see. It's a long way from uh, properties. They're not going to be heard either. Well, uh, I think probably, uh, as you say, some signage first up. Get this ramp out of the, equation, of the equation. And uh, perhaps some actual some physical barrier over there. And uh, a camera. Plenty of opportunities There's to put a, a covert camera up here. And just uh, keep a record of what's who's actually doing what here. Because it's, it's that common, beautiful combination of prevention and then also being able to find them once the, once, you know, the crime's taken place. Yeah. Ideally, prevention is better than cure, yeah. as the adage goes. So um, making it as difficult as possible for the offending to occur. But if it should occur, uh, making sure that there is uh, the evidence which is needed to uh, pursue those uh, offenders. Now, well, I can see I've got some room for improvement here. So. Yes. As have a lot of us. <laughs> and isn't it good to accept that and to actually yes. do something about it rather yes. than put your head in the sand yes. and hope it doesn't happen to you. And I think that's one of the major messages that we're getting out of today, yes. isn't it? Prevent, prevent, prevent. Yeah. There's a, uh, a notion of optimal foraging theory and it comes from the animal sciences. So an animal will, will go and find a food supply Yes. Uh, and rather than going and finding a food supply somewhere else, as long as it's it's there and uh, and it's uh, available and it's yes. plentiful, they'll keep coming back to the same spot. A yes. will do the same thing. So they will find, rather than going to a hundred different farms, if they can come back to the same one and know that they're not going to get caught, they will just keep on doing it. Yeah, fair, so it's about being point. disruptive. Yes, mm. good point. Alan? Thank you for opening your no. property to this discussion, <laughs> mate, and for having such good ideas. Thank you. I always appreciate it. Thank you, Alistair. And good Alistair, you. thank you so much today for the time that you've spent with our three different farms, um, having a look at the basics of rural crime prevention, what rural crime is, how it occurs, and how we can stop it. No worries at all. It's been a pleasure. That's awesome. Yeah. Guys, if you like this sort of video, please don't forget, hit the subscribe button, give it a thumbs up, and there's plenty more content on timthompson.ag. I'll see you next week. Alan will probably see you in a month. Alistair, it's been an absolute pleasure and I hope I see you again. No worries at all. Thanks very much, Tim. Cheers.